Welcome everybody to another edition of UFO Man Live. My name is UFO Man, and to my side is my co-host, my friend Tommy Highway. Tommy, folks, I'm Tommy Highway. Great to be here with you this evening. I want to thank everybody for coming out for us. That's great. Uh, we have an awesome uh, guest with us tonight. Tonight we have Tracy, the Survivor Girl herself, super gr uh, cool person. She's going to be on with a panel with us tonight. Also, we are having a little bit of a technical difficulty with Tim's audio. Uh, we apologize for that. He may come off a little bit loud, and unfortunately, we don't really have enough time to do anything with that at this point. So if you could just bear with us on that, that'd be fantastic. Uh, Tracy, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here. I, I appreciate you guys asking me to be on the show. I've learned a lot okay. about not all, not probably half as much as I want to know now. I've gone down the rabbit hole with you guys with the UFO stuff now. You're, you're more than you're more than welcome to be here. I've known you for a few years, so uh, it's very nice to have you on. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, tonight we have several different stories that we're going to talk about, but first we're going to start with our first segment, which is on Kenneth Arnold, the first really recorded UFO sighting. Tommy. That's right. Kenneth Arnold, um, very interesting story. He's um, he's the person that actually coined the phrase flying saucer, even though that was kind of taken out of context to actually what he said. Uh, let me go ahead and pull up my article here, and I'm going to read some things uh, from about um, this gentleman and tell you a little bit about the sighting here. Bear with me a moment, please. Yeah, this... Um article that he's reading is uh kenneth arnold's real words from his own mouth that's right and, and I've, i apologize for that folks i've pulled it up here the following story of what i observed over the cascade mountains as impossible as it may seem is positively true i never asked nor wanted any notoriety for just accidentally being in the night in the right spot at the right time to observe what i did I reported something that I know any pilot would have reported. I don't think in any way my observation was due to my sensitivity of eyesight or judgment than what was than what is considered normal for any pilot. In other words, he, he could see like a like an eagle. On June 24th, Tuesday, 1947, I had finished my work for the Central Air Service at is it Sh Shalalis? Shahalis. Chehalis, thank you very much for that, Washington. And at about 2 o'clock, I took off from Chehalis, Washington Airport with the intention of going to Yakima, Washington. My trip was delayed for an hour to search for a large marine transport that supposedly went down near or around the southwest side of Mount Rainier in the state of Washington and to date has never been found. That's interesting. I flew directly toward Mount Rainier after reaching an altitude of about 9,500 feet, which is the approximate elevation of the high plateau which Mount Rainier rises. I had made one sweep of this high plateau to the westward, searching all of the various ridges for this marine ship and flew to the west down and near the ridge side of the canyon where Ashford, Washington is located. Unable to see anything that looked like a lost ship, I made a 360-degree turn to the right and above the initial city of Min Mineral, starting again toward Mount Rainier. I climbed back up to an altitude of approximately 9,200 feet. The air was so smooth that day that it was a real pleasure flying, and as most pilots do when the air is smooth and they are flying at a higher altitude, I trimmed out my airplane in the direction of Yakima, Washington, which was almost directly east of my position and simply sat in my plane observing the sky and terrain. Okay. There was a DC-4 to the left and the rear of me approximately 15 miles distance, and I should judge at 14,000 feet elevation. The sky and air was clear as, as crystal. I hadn't flown for more than two or three minutes on my course when a bright flash reflected on my airplane. It startled me as I thought it was too close to some other aircraft. I looked every place in the sky and couldn't find where the reflection had come from until I looked to the left and north of Mount Rainier, where I observed a chain of nine peculiar-looking aircraft flying from north to south at approximately 9,500 feet. 
seemingly in a definite direction of about 170 degrees. So these things are basically saying is that they're basically flying in formation. They were approaching Mount Rainier very rapidly, and I merely assumed that they were jet planes. Anyhow, I discovered that this was where the reflection had come from, as two of the three of them every few seconds would dip um, or change their course slightly, just enough for the sun to strike them at an angle that reflected brightly on my plane. These objects being far, quite far away, I was unable for a few seconds to make out their shape or their formation. Very shortly, they approached Mount Rainier, and I observed their outline against the snow white plain, quite plainly. I thought it was very peculiar that I couldn't find their tails, but assumed that they were some type of jet plane. I was determined to clock their speed, and as I had two definite points I could clock them by, the air was so clear that it was very easy to see objects and determine their approximate shape and size and almost 50 miles that day. So, I remember distinctly that my sweep second hand on my right hand on my eight day clock, which is located on my instrument panel, read one minute to three p.m. As the first object of this formation passed the southern edge of Mount Rainier, I watched these objects with great interest, as I had never before observed anything like this. I never, did, I never observed airplanes flying so close to the mountaintops, flying directly south to southeast down on the hog's back of the mountain range. I would estimate that their elevation could have been varied to a thousand feet one way or another, up or down, but they were pretty much on the horizon with me, uh, which would indicate that they were near the same elevation that I was. Tim, you want to go ahead and run that um, that that uh, video you've got there? Sure. I noticed to the left of me a chain, which looked to me like the tail of a Chinese kite, uh, kind of weaving and going at a terrific speed across the face of Mount Rainier. Because of this man. Um, anyway, he goes on to say that they flew like many times I have observed geese to fly in a rather diagonal chain like line as if they were linked together. They seemed to hold a definite direction, but rather swerved in and out of the high mountain peaks. Their speed at the time did not impress me particularly because I knew that our army had air forces, had planes that went that very fast. So, I mean, this is jet, the jet age had just happened when this is going down. Okay. So we had very few examples of jet aircraft out there. I mean, this was something that was relatively new technology. I mean, I'm not even sure if the Saber jet was out yet in, in, um, in 47, it may, it may not come out to like the early fifties. And that's okay. a pretty rudimentary jet. You know I mean? That's like, that's as basic as it comes, so to speak. Um, Anyway, he goes on to say, what kept bothering me was as I watched them flip and flash in the sun along their path was the fact that I couldn't make out any tail on them. When I am sure that any pilot would justify more than a second look at such a plane, I observed them quite plainly and I estimated my distance from them, which was almost at right angles to be between 20 to 25 miles. I knew that they must be very large to observe their shape at that distance, even on a a clear day as it was that Tuesday. In fact, I compared a, Z a Zeiss, I think, fastener or cowling tool that I had in my pocket with them, holding it up and holding it up to the DC-4 that I could observe at quite a distance to my left, and they seemed smaller than the DC-4. But I should judge their span would have been as wide as the furthest engines on each side of the fuselage of the DC-4. So it's roughly half the size of that plane is what he's saying. The more I observed these objects, the more I upset I became, as I am accustomed to familiar and, and with and familiar with most all objects flying, whether I am close to the ground or at high altitudes. I observed the chain of these objects passing another snow covered ridge in between Mount Rainier and Mount Adams. And as the first one was passing the south crest of that ridge, the last object was entering the northern crest of the ridge. As I was flying in the direction of this particular ridge, I measured it and found it to be approximately five miles 
so I could safely assume that the chain of these saucer-like objects were at least five miles long. I could quite accurately determine their pathway due to the fact that they were seven or several high peaks that were a little on the, I'm sorry, there were several high peaks that were a little this side of them as well as higher peaks on the other side of their pathway. As the last unit of this formation passed the southernmost high snow-covered crest in Mount Adams, I looked at my sweep and se at second hand, and it showed that they had traveled the distance in one minute and forty-two seconds. Even at that time, even at the time, this was timing did not upset me. I felt confident after I would land there, and there would be some explanation of what I saw. So he's assuming that you know he's. Some every other, other people saw this. The DC-3 pilots probably saw that, and somebody's probably going to have an explanation for what they are. Um, again, this was very early in ufology. And a number of newsmen and experts suggested that I might have been seeing reflections or even a mirage. This I know to be absolutely false, as I observed these objects not only through the glass of my airplane, but turned my airplane sideways where I could open my window and observe them with a completely unobstructed view. Okay? Even... Though the two minutes seemed like a very short time to, to, to one on the ground, in the air, two minutes in time and a pilot can be observed a great many things. And anything within this sight, his sight of vision, probably as many as 50 or 60 times. I continued my search for the marine plane and for another 15 or 20 minutes. And while searching for the marine plane, I had just observed what I kept going through my mind. I became more disturbed. So after tracking the last look, I'm sorry, after taking the last look at the Teton Reservoir, I headed for Yakima. I might add that my complete observation of these objects, which, can I, which I could even follow by their flashes as they passed Mount Adams, was around two. So, I mean, again, this is, this is something that, I mean, we looked around when we wanted to do this story and we found that there really aren't a lot of channels out there covering this. And we were kind of mystified by that because again, this is, this is probably the most important sighting of all time. If you think about it, Tim, do you agree with that? Yes, I agree with that. In fact, uh, we have corroboration two weeks after Kenneth Arnold saw uh, what he did near Mount Rainier uh, traveling close to Mount Adams. There was a minor who actually saw the same thing. He was looking up in the sky and he saw them fly over and he corroborated the actual sighting of Kenneth Arnold. Um, this is the first time someone could back up what Kenneth Arnold claimed. Then a month later, a guy by the name of John Rhodes, right here, John Rhodes, took out his camera because he heard a humming sound outside and he went outside and he took a picture of what he thought would be a jet or a plane. And this is what he took. Picture of this. This is supposedly the first real UFO photo ever taken other than the one that we've all seen back against the clouds from like the early 1900s. But this is from uh, 1947, and it also correlates with the sighting that uh, Kenneth Arnold had. In fact, here's a drawing of Kenneth Arnold's sighting, signed by Kenneth Arnold. I know you can't see it, but it is signed. And then William Rhodes' photo. Sorry, I got his name wrong. William Rhodes. And the back end of it looks a lot like what Kenneth Arnold saw. It was also posted in the paper. But what happened, Tommy, the media misinterpreted what Kenneth Arnold said, right? Exactly. And, and basically, he's trying to describe these objects. <clears throat> and somehow it got misconstrued that and basically they twisted his words a little bit into the, what it basically he saw was flying saucers. And that's why we have the term today, because of Kenneth Arnold uh, and the media, frankly. Yeah, the media coined the term. That's what I read. Yep. What are your thoughts on this one, Tracy? Uh, I, was, I was doing a little bit of research on the Area 51, and uh, it was saying that they had developed a plane that was 
it was called a U-2 spy plane. And this was in 55. And yeah, it's not quite as fast as what he's describing the, um, you know, the 1200 miles per hour, but I wouldn't put it past that they couldn't have developed something that fast. Um, what I had read was he thought it was going about 1200 miles per hour. And, and I'm wondering about the, the, cause there was a Marine Corps C-46 transport plane, like you said, you know, that was, um, was down. I'm wondering, I tried to find any stories on that and I couldn't, I couldn't find anything saying if they found it or not. And I'm wondering if that plane that was 15 miles behind him, um, did they see what he saw? And um, is it possible they were all related? And he just happened to be there. I know he was flying in his like own personal two seater uh, plane that he and he, mm-hmm. you know, being a, right. I guess he was, a, you know, a mili- military man himself and had done like nine over nine thousand hours of pilot time. So he was experienced. Mm-hmm. So I don't doubt that he saw anything. I'm just wondering if like in many incidences where the military ends up saying, you know, maybe three years later, Oh, we were testing this. or we were testing that, you know, we didn't have that. You you make a very interesting point. Think, let's think about this for a second. Could this be, I mean, that, that C 47 was out there uh, basically in in the same space. So, they probably got to look at these things too, but she's right. And there's never been any reports. I don't think anybody's ever corroborated this man's story. And, well, but could, could well, hang on. Could it have been because the C 47 pilots did see it and could they be some of the first people um, that were afraid to come forward? You know what I mean? With it. Exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. Now it could be that the classified report in regards to this uh, wasn't released. But the corroboration thing, John Rhodes did corroborate it, and so did that minor. Now, being that they're not military, they're not official, mm-hmm. but they did corroborate the, uh, the report. Um, this guy and this guy. And this guy is John Rhodes. This guy up here, I think, is just a recreation. But anyways, two people did. Now, I got to correct something. Um, the determined speed of the objects was 1,657 miles per hour. And that's uh, the covering the five-mile stretch in a minute 40, what, a minute 41 seconds? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, they figure nothing in anyone's arsenal on the planet at that time had that capability. Now, um, hard to say. Hard to say because we got a lot of technology in 1942 after the war from Germany. Yeah, but we it was it was still years before we even broke the sound barrier after that. So, you know, you're still talking about even like the Sabre jet, which is the Sabre jet, folks, for those of you who don't know, is basically the jet that started the Korean War. At least that was I, I don't mean started it, but that they started fighting with that jet. It, it led to other things. And the Sabre jet itself was a very rudimentary jet aircraft. I mean, it's just about as simple and basic as it gets. It is subsonic, so it's not going to break the sound barrier and all that. Um, so w- we didn't have the ability to do that for many years later. So, you know, who knows? But, I mean, maybe we had, maybe Uncle Sam did have something super secret up his sleeve. But, I mean, boy, well, I tell we you, didn't it, have the ability to do it. But how do we not know that, like, that U-2 spy jet that we had developed here, um, how do we not know that another country hadn't developed something, you know, already that was that super, you know, super we, that, we, that was, you know, we don't we don't know. Right. That's the whole point. Right. I mean, things classified and compartmentalized, and it's very difficult to discern the truth, and that's why we're right. digging. Right, right, exactly. That's where that whole rabbit hole comes into because, and you're. Um, other topic the high jump in the project high jump looking at some of the stuff that i was researching the germans seem to have quite capabilities um i you know they were correlating that whole that whole um incident with Mm -hmm. something to do with the nazis and the germans and 
stuff that they'd been doing from 1939 was pretty right. uh, interesting, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And and the Nazis they, they had they had their hands into a lot of strange stuff. There's no we've talked about the Glocked Bell before on the program and and things like that. Uh, and that the what's the Canabu or the Hanabu is it? H Hanabu and the Hanabu. Brill. And yeah. The Brill. Tim, that the, Tim's big. Uh, Tim loves those. Um, um, also, there's the Flux Liner uh, that w had anti gravity in 1939 and was operational, and we had it in the United States. Um, it also was hyperluminal drive, which means faster than light. So dependent on what you believe, maybe some of those vehicles that Kenneth Arnold uh, witnessed were actually our technology. It's unknown at this time. We, we just don't or know. Or another country is just busting out of here, you know? Or, or another country, yeah. It could be anyone. Yeah. Uh, just like Can I you. answer Luke Aesthetic question sure. in the in the chat room? Sure. And uh, they said, hey folks, have you ever seen a UFO and they're in Massachusetts? I just wanted to relay an experience because I'm in Massachusetts as well. And um, I was sitting with my friend and, you know, we were just like, you know, we were 420, right? Whatever you say, right? And I'm talking and jabbing and, and, uh, and watching the skies. I like to stargaze. And um, one of the things that I noticed was this thing was in front of us. Um, and it was D-shaped, and the lights were, now see, I had been watching the skies pretty, you know, uh, intensely for, a, a, you know, a while, so I would have seen if something flew in. So this thing didn't just seem to fly in, it just seemed to appear there. It was right there, and it seemed that it was close, but it, there's no way something that big with that bright of light could have been that close and it had white light and they were on each side and it was at first I thought maybe it's a plane but it was swinging like a pendulum it wasn't flying it was just swinging back and forth back and forth back and forth and the, and its size too was something that you know I might if it was far far away I might wonder if my eyes were playing tricks on me about the formation that it was you know swinging but um because it was appeared to be so close so i turned to my friend and mind you thank god somebody else was there because if someone else wasn't there i don't even think i believe my own eyes but i said you know what would you say that is and he looks at it and he said well i'd have to say that's a plane and he didn't even get the word plane out before it disappeared. It didn't fly away because you'd see it fly away. It didn't turn off its lights and the you know image of it was still there. It didn't do that. It disappeared. Wow. So that's you know really incredible to me that um I just to answer their question, yes, I have seen something. They say that they see at least three a year, they say um loot loot aesthetic. That's right. Cool. Mm -hmm. yeah, if we're going to talk about that, I actually had a UFO sighting about a week ago, uh, went outside, completely socked in by low cloud cover, bright white light mm -hmm. to the to the northeast, huge. I thought it was a planet poking through the clouds, but it was impossible because the clouds were really low and they're really thick. So this object was lower but it was extremely bright. And I was watching it just to see if it would make any move. And it did, it dimmed out and blinked out. Now it seemed like it disappeared into the cloud bank, but I, I don't know what it was. I have no idea. It happened recently, like a week ago. Yep. Interesting. It's funny because even tonight when I was outside, um, it was just before I came up, you know, so it was about quarter to, quarter to nine and so it, it wasn't completely dark out but there was, it was a totally clear sky so if the stars were going to appear that early i would think they would but there was just this one huge light and yeah maybe it's the north star i don't know though because it just 
it, it was just odd, you know, it seemed like it wasn't a plane. I know that I, I did a little clip of a video just to announce too that I, we'd be here talking about UFOs, but it was just odd that when I went out there, here was this one thing in the sky, just this one, you know, and we don't know what anything is actuality. I mean, like I said, uh, with you guys asking me on here, I started doing so much research that, wow, I just, mm -hmm. I'm amazed. Yeah. Oh, it's a it's a big topic. It's a big subject, and it's wide. It's really wow. hard to wrap your head around everything that's going on and things yeah. that people in general don't know what's going on. Sean Mack in the mm -hmm. chat room said, is our military really that advanced to really to us what is what when this country was just overwhelmed with what is happening now? Uh, the political side of the country is what's overwhelming us. Uh, mm -hmm. The military side and the elite cabal that controls the technology, in my opinion, is ex extremely advanced. In fact, he, Benny Rich of Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, before he passed away, stated that we have the technology to take E.T. home. Mm -hmm. And that was in 93. So if that's the case then yes, we are extremely advanced. And that Tic Tac that was seen may or may not be our own technology. You said Lockheed Martin? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's who um, actually was the one that was working on that U-2 spy plane in 1955. That's yep. the one who had the plan. Yeah, it was Lockheed Martin. Mm -hmm. Skunk Works. Mm-hmm. You yeah. betcha. Well, you know, leading into that, Tim, you think we should go ahead and roll our fantastic video review of the week? Oh, sure. Why not? Let's see here. I'll get it going. Okay, Tracy, when we run this video review, feel free to comment. Okay. I love this video. I mean, it's got the camera shake. It's got the object, the object slightly moving. I mean, it's very, very, I mean, it's a very good quality video. And he even zooms out to show distance. See? Somebody said to me they thought it might be a Zeppelin, but I don't think so. Mm. No gondola on it that, that I can see. No tail. They, didn't they used to use like uh, those big, yeah, those blimps? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I mean, I wish you'd have zoomed in, right? I got to zoom in at the it end. It is very interesting, though. Like, oh, you do? Yes. And this is recently. That's the zoom in right there. This is the one Tommy likes. Oh, I love this. I love this. Now wait until you see it back up. There's the girl. She's pointing at it. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Think Tic Tac, folks. Look at that. I love this. I mean, I, I think that this is authentic all day. We've looked at this from a bunch of different angles, and we've discussed this video at, at, at nauseam between the two of us. And I, I don't want to speak for Tim, but I'm pretty sure he feels the same way. This is authentic. This is the real deal. 
I think it's authentic because the ones that are CGI kind of look like a bluish green color, and this one is not. Mm -hmm. And when you when you zoom now that does in, look kind of like a Zeppelin. And when you oh, zoom, it, did that move just that that fast? Yeah, Was that it moving that fast? Yeah, 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 that's not a Zeppelin. Oh, oh, wow! That changes everything. Mm -hmm. Right. Wait till you see the zoom in. It's uh, very hard to make out. I mean, it just zips in there. If this is a hoax, somebody went to an awful lot of trouble. I mean, they, I think I think if you're going to hoax, uh, create a hoax, you can make a better quality video out of it. But this, to me, this just screams absolute authenticity. It really does. Folks, I think we're looking at an alien spacecraft. Look, there's the I'd have shot to agree. right there. I mean, because that is, that's weird. All right. I'm actually seeing some lights for the very first time living in Arizona. I've been waiting for this moment. They actually just split. And they're blinking. That and looks pretty real too. She's standing, she's standing in the middle. She's standing in the middle of the freeway. She's she's on the side of the freeway. And they're, but they're we're on one, and then it just split. So that's very strange. I have no idea what right. those lights are. Let's see if I can zoom in even more here. There's like a helicopter flying over the top of them. A couple of them. Yep. They're blinking. I mean. Wish my phone would. Backwoods Buster said uh, something interesting. A little bit better here. Let's see said do you think that they're traveling not only them but some of them when their people are recording this footage that they should be breaking the sonic boom oh any anytime something anytime th something moves past what 1200 feet per 1300 feet per second it's going to break the sound barrier at least as, as technology as we know it how come we don't hear it then because it somehow or another they've got some kind of a dampening a way of dampening that so it's it's not a it's not a problem for them oh like a silencer which would work as a silencer on a gun sort of mm. the other set is still there i'll just turn the volume off for a minute thank you right on you're welcome the traffic is annoying but if you look those lights maintain their position yep and they maintain their uh, distance from each other. Now she's just looking at the lower four right now. Mm -hmm. If those are drones, those are awfully big ones, and they got a hell of a light on them. From what somebody That's told very me interesting what you said about creating something like a silencer. That's interesting because it's the <clears throat> bullet breaking the sound barrier, right, that mm -hmm. creates right. the bang from a gun, you know, when someone shoots. Right. So that's mm -hmm. what a silencer is for. So, I mean, a very huge silencer, I guess, however technology well, they have. Well, the, the theory is, is that they're, they're projecting some sort of a field around their craft that makes them uh, basically immune, if you will, to terrestrial physics. And that's why they're able to Absolutely, do that without breaking yeah. the sound barrier. Wow. Very interesting. That's, I mean, I just, if those are, if those are drones, I, they're awfully far away, they're awfully bright, and they look awfully big to me. Well, the thing I've been told lately, they've developed, some drone operators have developed a way to mount a million candle light, candle power lights on the drones, and that it, they can, at times, fool the public. But are I we? think that the owners are very limited. 
yeah, we've we've been fooled by drones before, um, no doubt about it. <clears throat> There's that. Remember, they had circular thing, the blue lights. I mean, that that had me going, and it turns out that that was actually drones. Yeah, the circular one that we saw. Yep, yeah, they were drones from that drone school. Mm -hmm. And there's a picture of the actual two objects. Here are the four on the bottom. There you go. Mm -hmm. It it's funny because that particular sighting um, reminds me of a story that after this I'll tell you, but that I was really interested in. Oh yeah, I love this one too. Now on what the left is the here? on the left is the video footage of a telescope filming something rising out of the ocean. And it says St. Really? Pierre, Canada, but it isn't. It's Reunion Island, Canada. And that's the picture up top and that No, the picture the up right top is a, is the one up top is a comparison photo from the USS Trepang SSN 674 in 1971 shot through a periscope. And this one down mm. here is October 11th, 2019. Wow. Interesting. Now I will get closer so everybody can get a close up shot. Hope you guys didn't hear my stomach. The 71 thing was that that's always been a big one. That's a big, that's a very famous sighting right there. Right, it is. Uh, somebody suggested that this might be a parasail being filmed through the uh, telescope. But what I argue is, where's the boat? Now, here's the close-up. And it looks like he's laying in the water, and it's solid, and it is uh, triangular. Can I? Uh, I don't even want to say his name. Harry, the guy Harry, with the yeah, well, yeah. his last name in there, right? Um to say about those lights and he's saying that they use phosphorus, it's very funny that he's saying that because when I said there's a story I want to mention to you that's odd because those lights look like this particular thing, was there was a guy um, who was on the space station, okay? And this was in, uh, I thought this was just crazy. Um, he was Okay, came aboard. The, he saw space light, you know, in space, like flying by. It was the four light, the same kind of formation of that that they were saying. And also, they were talking about the moon Europa of Jupiter, saying that they have blood red veins that light up. And they're thinking that it could be liquid water on there even though it's supposed to be all ice and maybe it's living things that have phosphorus that are making it light up when we look at it and I just thought it was odd that he said they use phosphorus because it was you know kind of coincidental they were saying the same thing okay, this is a, this was yeah. awesome this one is fantastic. This is right above Fukushima. Okay, it's, we all know that's the site of the uh, nuclear disaster after the. Um, it was about ten years ago after that uh, tsunami. Now, as we all know, UFOs love nuclear stuff. They uh, they absolutely do. We we our nuclear installations, our nuclear bases, our nuclear vessels, all of that. And it looks like we've got another example of that. Here we go. Yes, uh, the ones on the bottom are from El Rosario, Mexico in 2009, two years prior to that. So it's a comparison. Yep. This is Fukushima right here. And what's interesting is somebody mentioned to me that they might be drones, but drones don't merge into one light. And if you watch at the end here, they'll all merge into one, one bright white light. So either they're entering a portal or they're becoming wow, yeah. one I object. Do that. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's, that's just man. that's just wild now. Yeah, that is really Look at rare. that. Wow. It's like they're doing a light show for us. It's uh, somebody also that's mentioned maybe they're coming I've never even down. seen that. Where is it? Fukushima. Fukushima. Where is that like Japan? Yeah, yes. that's that's that nuclear plant that melted down there about 10 years ago. Right above really? it. Really? Yeah. Yeah, because of the tsunami that hit. It's just really hard to explain that one, folks. Yeah, that's weird, too. Yeah. It's like a big pipe. A lot of orbs coming out. It almost looks like they're exiting a portal in the center or a, another ship. And then they're being spewed out and then they're being collected. Mm -hmm. That's strange. Uh, yeah, there was like some kind of sighting over the Puget Zone where uh, Puget Sound, I'm sorry, Puget Sound, if that's how you say it, mm -hmm. um, where one of the craft seemed like it was having problems. There was a group of them and it started to shake and shudder and it spit out um, this metal into the sound yeah. and it even hit. Yeah, yeah. The slag, mm -hmm. they found slag on the ground and they picked mm -hmm. it up and uh, it had uh, more radiation than the background irradiation. So yeah, yeah. I've personally yep. seen I've personally seen this happen. Yeah, this That's one right. This UFO sighting here is over Louisville, Kentucky, and these objects maintained the same position until the very end of the video. Um, there are five of them. Uh, somebody thought it might be a TR3B, but in my impression it's not because the tr3b has three white lights on one on each corner and a red light mm -hmm. in the center this is something other yeah it, it does maintain its position and there was a helicopter flying over it in the beginning uh monitoring it that's what i saw it looked like like that yep, you you are correct and... tracy yeah you are correct I just thought this was a unique sighting. Very, no, very, very. There's a picture there, and here's another close up. Looks like a face. <laughs> UFO with two lights over Ball Ground, Georgia. This is a daylight footage. Daylight is always rare, huh? And you can tell that is not a mm -hmm. plane. I question it a little bit. I'm on the fence on this one because I don't know if it is a UFO or if it's a drone. Because a lot of drones or, have their yeah. have their blades in the center. And this thing here has like a hollow center, like it's um, a donut. But when you see it up close, you're going to see a light on the top and a light on the bottom. Hmm when it turns you'll see a light flash it does look like a drone but watch there's a light on top yep then there's a light on the bottom and i will try to get closer it's just interesting I don't know. Drone? I'm not sure about that. Maybe. Uh, the witness has claimed it was 30 to 40 feet across, but that could still be a drone. This, mm -hmm. this has a light on the top and one on the bottom. A white light that flashes. Weird how the clouds are moving, though, behind it. Like, is, that, is it sped up or something? <clears throat> Well, it's moving around. No, but see how the clouds are, too? Yeah. Okay, there. Mm. You can see the light. The one down below and the one up above. See him? Mm, right that is here. weird. That is here. weird. Looks like a chicken. Or like a turkey. <laughs> bald eagle. <laughs> yeah, it's a bald eagle. Yeah.
These are interesting. Okay, I'm going to turn on the sound on this one. Hey, you guys. Yeah. I got a UFO. I got something. Where? Look over there in the middle of the mountain. The bottom, turn near the bottom. That far away. Wow. Right at yeah. the bottom. That's two headlights. And here it looks like two lights. Look at that. Headlights. Look. Um, yeah, I see. I can't. Yeah. That's, That's weird. a heck of a camera. What is that? I don't know. It's pointing towards I us. I can't get still. It's lined up with you, Dad. It's gone. <laughs> what? That's weird. What is that? What could that be? I don't know. It's shining brighter now. What is that? I can kind of see the two dots. It won't stop shaking. There's nothing to focus on, so it won't stop shaking. It's much shinier than the snow on the top. Yeah, look at that. It's two dots, definitely, if this thing has stopped shaking. I can see it shaking from here. What the hell is that? I don't know. It's definitely two dots. Did you record? Looks like two lights. Look at that. Like Look. Can... Yeah, I see. I can't. Yeah, that's weird. Definitely interesting, whatever it was. <gasps> Ray! What? I got it on my phone. I got it on my phone. Oh I got it on my phone. I got it on my phone. She got it on the phone. <laughs> Did she get it on the phone? <laughs> yeah, she got it on the phone. She got it on the phone. <laughs> oh, no way. <laughs> no way, Kayla! <laughs> like, Use your fingers. Oh, oh. no way. <laughs> no way, Kayla. Oh, no way. <laughs> no way. Hey, guys, I got to tell you, I've been leaning towards thinking this might be a drone rather than a UFO. I've been looking at this video for days and, um, the lights just seem to be fixed like it might be on a beam or something like uh, uh, a strip of LED lights or something like that. It, it just appears uh, not to be a UFO, although it could be. So place your comments below and let me know what you think. And as always, thank you for watching. It's pretty spectacular. I mean, it's got symmetry to it. Something there. Yeah. Don't know what it is. That was the shape of what I saw, I'm telling you. It was lit up. It was B-shaped. Hi, Alex. Phoebe Cooper. Hi. Hi, Alex. Thanks for coming. <laughs> this is weird because when he zoomed in, it turned green. And it does move. Um, the actual object does have movement to it. I'll zoom Is there in audio closer. to it? What are they saying? No, there's no audio to this one. Mm -hmm. Here, look. Hmm. It's I almost like his, ca his, his camera really can't handle the image. Yeah, right. Mm. That's, that's exactly what that is, Tim. That's, that's a digital processor trying to figure out what it's looking at. Right. It's a good example of showing mm. what that is. Yeah. As far as what the object is, no idea. Mm. 
Okay, what I'm going to do is we're going to bring up another video that we have that we didn't attach to the uh, UFO video review, but we want you to take a look at. Um, here, let's see if I can do this now. Take a look at this one. percebi que era porque ele aumentou muito forte a luz no ar. Como que você vai lá? Não, 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 não. Tá muito alto você do é. Well, that is just where really is that? something. Tim, where's this being where filmed? Uh, Cruzeiro, Brazil. And I actually checked a daylight shot. There are no skyscrapers in the area. Because at first, no back first, yeah. first thought, I thought it might be the top of a building, but it's not. Very strange. Yeah, you can see, like, you can see it right there, the whole image, pretty much. Basically, that's weird. Yeah. Right. And the guy is saying, I guess, in the translation, it's too disproportionate for a balloon or a blimp. Cara, agora me fala como que esse balão. What's in the background? Uh, nothing for a waves. This is really up close, so I would say um, I think there are hills in the background. But that's a large oops. Any way we could look it up, like and see the area of where it was and see what there's yeah, no plateaus uh, or anything. It's Cruzeiro, C R U Z E I R O, Brazil. Mm. It depends yeah, on. You know, yeah. the All Nazis right. went to Brazil, right? The boys from Brazil. No, the there's stuff. Made, you know. There's stuff. Alex, there is stuff there, DB Cooper. Um, there's mountains there. There's also hills there. It depends on your perspective on where they're seeing it. Is this another clip? No, I am um, oh. going to pull this one off. I was actually <clears throat> looking today when I was uh, watching the, a lot of stuff, and they were saying that something captured from space Okay, is triangular shape like what a lot of those UFOs look like. Mm -hmm. um, it's 350 feet in width and brightly lit. Now it was captured from space, and it's in Australia in a you know unoccupied area. And um, I, in fact, it'd been like an airplane that when flying over it, it. Uh, suffered from some interference and it lost control and the people in the plane were bouncing around. It cost, you know, caused over a hundred injuries and everything. Um, the funny thing is that on the exact opposite side of the world is the Bermuda Triangle. Hmm. Interesting. And, they, and when the guy went and they looked for it on the ground, they couldn't find it. But hmm. it's brightly lit. Well, supposedly we've got some really good shots from satellites and uh, and other means of UFOs all over the world. And again, we were hoping to see that kind of stuff for the UFO report, which we all got stiffed on. 
But that 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 footage, I believe it exists. I mean, there's just been too many sources that have come out and said that it does exist. Um, so you know, it's it's wild. But I'll tell you, Tim, you want to go ahead and talk about Operation High Jump, sir? Yes, uh, Tommy. I'm going to segue to you because you have the article on it. That's right, folks. The United States military did something odd, in my opinion, and I think a lot of other people's opinion as well, right after the, the end of the Second World War. Um, basically, between 46 and 47, an expedition was set out to go to the South Pole. Okay, Now, the expedition was under the guise, or supposed to be the, the, uh, the purpose of this, was because that there was supposedly a secret Nazi base in the South Pole. Now, let me go ahead and read this article. In fact, let me go ahead and share my screen with you. Okay, and I'll go ahead and read this, and you folks can just kind of follow along. This is a great story. An extraordinarily 2006 Russian documentary was recently translated into English, revealing new information about a U.S. Navy Antarctica expedition in 1946 and 47. Originally scheduled for a six-month period, the scientific expedition was officially called the United States Navy Arctic Development Program and given the operational name High Jump. The Navy, sorry, the Navy component of Operation High Jump was known as a Task Force 68 and comprised 4,700 military personnel, one aircraft carrier, the USS Philippine, um, and a number of naval support ships and aircraft. The naval expedition was headed by famed polar explorer Al Admiral Richard Byrd, who had been ordered to consolidate and extend the Amer American sovereignty over the largest practical area of the Antarctic continent. So in other words, not only were they there to look for these, these bases, these supposed Nazi bases, but they were there to basically scout it out to take our, take our claim on it, essentially. Um, Bird's expedition ended after only eight weeks with many fatalities, according to initial news reports, based on interviews with crew members who spoke to the press while passing through Chilean ports. Rather than deny the heavily casualty reports, Admiral Byrd revealed in a press interview that a Task Force 68 had encountered a new enemy that could fly from the pole to pole at incredible speeds. So, one of the most famous explorers of the 20th century is telling you that we've got a brand new enemy here, okay? That's, that's, I think that's uh, very profound, to say the least. <clears throat> to continue, Admiral Byrd's statements were published in the Chilean press, but never publicly confirmed by U.S. authorities. Indeed, Byrd did not speak again to the press about the Operation High Jump, leaving it for researchers to speculate for decades over what really happened and why Byrd was silenced. After the Soviet collapse in 1991, the KGB released previously classified files that cast light on the mysterious Byrd-led naval expedition to Antarctica. In 2006, a Russian documentary recently translated made public for the first time a 1947 secret Soviet intelligence report commissioned by Joseph Stalin, of all people, of task, of task 68's mission to Antarctica. So, in other words, the Russians were real interested in what we were doing there, okay? The intelligence report, gathered from the Soviet spies embedded in the U.S., revealed that the U.S. Navy had sent the military expedition to find and destroy a hidden Nazi base. On the way, they encountered a mysterious UFO force that attacked the military expedition, destroying several ships and significant number of planes. Indeed, Operation High Jump had suffered many casualties, as stated in initial press reports from Chile. While there, while there is a possibility that the report resulted from U.S. disinformation fed to, no, to a known Soviet mole, the more likely explanation is that the report exposes for the first known historical incident involving a battle between U.S. naval forces and an unknown UFO force stationed near Antarctica. Now, there's all kinds of stories about this. One of the stories it, uh, dictates that um, or indicates that at some point the aliens actually grabbed Admiral Byrd and basically said, look, we're going to let you leave, but don't you ever come back here again. Okay, And, and that's something that always stuck with me because this story has been around forever. Um, let me, to continue, it is a historical fact that Nazi Germany devoted significant resources to the exploration of Antarctica and established a pre-war presence there 
with its first mission to the Antarctic summer of 1938-39. According to a statement by Grand Admiral Donitz in 1943, the German submarine fl fleet is proud of having built for the Fuhrer and another part of the world, a Shangri-La land, an impregnable, an impregnable fortress. Um, if the fortress was it wasn't in our, our, I'm sorry, if the fortress was in Antarctica, was built by the Nazis or discovered there after the defeat of the of Nazi Germany, according to various sources, elite Nazi scientists and leaders escaped to this impregnable fortress by U-boats, two of which experienced difficulties and surrendered in Argentina. Yeah, we know that that the a lot of the Nazis ended up in Argentina. That was like their uh, their backup plan. Dr. Mengele, even of, of all people, even ended up there. In the Soviet intelligence report, never before known testimony by two U.S. Navy servicemen with Operation High Jump was revealed. A recent article in New Dawn by Frank Joseph gives us a detailed analysis of the two eyewitness accounts, only the latter of which was mentioned in 2006 Russian documentary. John P., I'm going to say, I don't even know how to pronounce that, a radio man stationed on the USS Brownson gave testimony of how UFOs appeared dramatically out of the ocean depths on January 17th, 1947, at 700 hours. So imagine that. So we've got multiple people that are coming out talking about this. This isn't just uh, the things, uh, the tales of lore. I mean, you've actually got sailors that have come on the record and said this is what happened, right? They've, they've actually come out. Now, I and my shipmates in the pilot house port si side observed for several minutes the bright lights that ascended about 45 degrees into the sky very quickly, which we couldn't ID. The lights, because of our radar was limited to 250 miles in a straight line. Over the next several weeks, according to the Soviet report, the UFOs flew close over the U.S. Naval Flotilla, which fired on the UFOs, which did retaliate with deadly effects, according to Lieutenant John Sayerson, a, a flying boat pilot. So another sail, another, um, another sailor that was there, and another person corroborating this, right? The thing shot vertically out of the water at tremendous velocity, as though pursued by the devil, and flew in between the masts of the ship at such a high speed at, that the radio towers oscillated back and forth in its turbulence. An aircraft Martin flying boat from the Curry Tuck, I guess, from the Curry Tuck that took off just a few moments later was struck in an unknown plane. Of, I'm sorry, was struck with an unknown type of ray from the object and almost instantly crashed into the sea near the vessel. About 10 miles away, the torpedo boat Maddox burst into flames and began to sink, having personally witnessed, I'm sorry, having personally witnessed this attack by an object that flew out of the sea. All I can say is it was frightening. I'll bet it was. So what we've got here is what they're telling us, folks, is that once this flotilla arrives at a certain sensitive part of, of, um, of Antarctica, they're attacked by multiple UFOs. And, I mean, apparently they're not playing around because they're actually destroying vessels at this point. This isn't something like tap on the shoulder. Uh, this is more serious than that. Uh, I, have to say, I have to say one thing. Uh, mm -hmm. so, some of the uh, craft, visualized by the sailors that reported to the news in Chile were actually described exactly as the uh, schematics of a Hanabu or a Brill disc from Germany. And if they had, yeah, if they had a I secret heard. underground base in Antarctica, it could have been their advancements that were attacking the fleet. Yes, yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, yeah, can I, I my I, my Please. study last night brought me to they it was a secret land operation and the it, the Germans called it base two eleven and what they had found was a warm huge underground lake and they were found only a kilometer under the ice and they were eighteen degrees Celsius which I meant to um you know like transfer transfer and, to Fahrenheit, but I didn't try. So if anybody knows, tell me. And it was it's located like a, above like the water. Yeah, and it says, and located above the water surface are dome-like vaults filled with warm air. 
For thousands of years, these warm rivers may have formed tunnels underground, ice tunnels, perfect for underground secret bases, easy access for submarines. At the start of 1939, regular trips were made between Antarctica and Germany, and a specially equipped modified research vessel named the Swabia. Uh, Queen Maud Land is what they were like, you know, heading towards, I guess. That's what it was. You know, um, the SME, SMS Schwaben, which they ended up, you know, calling it the Swabia, but it was spelled S C H W A B E N. Um, yeah, so basically they were, they had already, you know, had been going there. And, and I'm just wondering when we were like uh, questioning about the phosphorus and you know how like planting, planting can grow in the depths of the ocean and, you know, right. they have phosphorus and everything. Hmm. Isn't it possible that some scientists maybe had figured out how to use that same phosphorus and lighting, you know, lighting way for, you know, for what we're looking at. I mean, if Great. they were already yeah. in 1939, they, I mean, I'm just saying they, they were doing some shit that I, I'm, I'm shocked. Yeah. Like, the possibilities are, that. yeah, the possibilities are endless as mm -hmm. to what we may have or what we may have had even back then. Right. Um, let me go ahead and continue with this, folks. We've got a little bit more here. Okay. There is a major problem with Sayerson's quote. There has been no torpedo boat named Maddox in the U.S. Navy. In the Russian documentary, the incident described by Sayerson refers, refers instead to the, tor I'm sorry, to the destroyer Murdoch. There was, however, no destroyer named Murdoch, active in the U.S. fleet in 1947. Instead, there was a destroyer named Maddox. Uh, but did not serve in Operation High Jump. In fact, the USS Maddox was the destroyer fired upon in the Gulf of Tonkin incident in 1964. <clears throat> According to Frank Joseph, the USS Maddox was either a torpedo boat or a torpedo-carrying destroyer. Uh, he goes on to explain what may, have been, what may have happened to the Maddox mentioned in the Soviet report. The USS Maddox was indeed sunk by enemy action but five years earlier by German dive bombing during the Allied invasion of Sicily. Actually, there were at least three American destroyers known by that name, all of them contemporaneous. Uh, the U.S. Navy has long been notorious for falsely identifying uh, the fault, I'm sorry, falsifying the identity of its ships and rewriting their histories if they embarrass the, the official policy. So, too, the Maddox cited Soviet espionage was similarly consigned to an official memory hole. So, what they're saying here is, I mean, what do you what do you do with a ship? You got the USS Maddox out there, and it just got KO'd by a UFO. It's been destroyed. It's gone. Everybody on board that ship is now dead. Now, what do you do with that if you're the military? I mean, a lot of families are going to be asking questions, things of that nature. I mean, this is a it's a PR nightmare at the very least. German so, you boat. That's what I would say. Yeah, and that's that's what they would have done, but they would have either done that or they would have just completely covered it up all the way. I think it's what he's getting at here. They're just covering it up so that so that it's you know it's uh, out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. Okay, let me go ahead and, and bring who on home that, here, folks. That they would possibly rewrite rewrite their history. Who's who's saying that? Well, I mean, it's something that let's see here. Da, 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 da. I don't know if any one person's actually saying that, but I mean, they're, they're just implying that, that, that they wouldn't put it past the no, United I, States. Like, military. Who wrote it anyway? I. That's such a, you know, like, wow thing to hear. I mean, yep. I know we all suspect it, but, you know, to see it like yep. right like that. It goes on to say, if Joseph is correct, then it is very possible that the USS Maddox was destroyed during Operation High Jump. And the U.S. Navy changed the official records to hide this. An alternate explanation is that the 1947 Soviet report contained U.S. orchestrated disinformation that was being conveyed to Soviet authorities by a Soviet mole known by the U.S. intelligence community. Though plausible, this is highly unlikely given that the U.S. and USSR were still allies at the time of the Operation High Jump and had a common interest in finding and destroying 
any hidden Nazi bases in South uh, in the South Atlantic. Now, I I agree with that. That that's been my whole thing with this the whole time. Why would we at this point? First of all, why would we feed the Russians this kind of disinformation? I mean, UFOs, really? I mean, there's all kinds of other disinformation that's more plausible that they could have actually fed to the spies. So, did to you me, watch that documentary that they're talking about, the Russian one? I have not seen it yet. No, I have. Yeah, I sent it to you last night. So if you get a okay. chance, watch it. It's so interesting. It is captioned, uh, but it is extremely I've seen it. interesting. I've seen it. The one about you the USOs. <clears throat> about, about the, the USOs? Operation High Jump. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's yeah. about the Operation High Jump. Yeah, I okay. saw that. I yep. can drop right. it in the link in the chat room if you want. I can yeah, drop a yeah, link go for if it. you want. You can drop it in the chat room All right, for I the will. people in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, the destructive, yeah, really interesting. the destructive technology used by the UFOs and the Soviet intelligence report was not something that had been developed by the defeated Nazis, who had only shortly before their only shortly been before forced to retreat to the South Atlantic. It appears the UFOs were not intent on destroying the Task Force sixty eight, but forcing it to turn back. Were the UFOs protecting the retreating Nazis and or their own presence in Antarctica? Was the Stalin era report disinformation deliberately fed to Soviet authorities by U.S. intelligence? Was this the most likely answer? Well, the most likely answer is that the Soviet era report released in 2006, the Russian documentary was substantially correct about that. This suggests that Admiral Byrd's initial press report was accurate. A new enemy that could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds had emerged. Most importantly, the UFO force had inflicted heavy casualties on the U.S. Navy that was powerless to oppose it. The world's first known battle between the United States military and an unknown UFO fleet based near Antarctica very likely occurred in 1947, and the general public has never learned about it until now. Now, here's the thing. Okay, we... When it comes to our naval, our, our navy, and all that, by the end of the Second World War, we've got the navy figured out. Okay, we should be able to send ships anywhere, any part on this planet, and not just have a bunch of casualties for no reason. Okay, I mean, it just doesn't work that way. I mean, somebody always dies, you know, from an accident or whatever. But you're talking mass casualties here. We're talking about ships that were destroyed. We're talking about a lot of sailors that are dead, and we still have a wishy-washy explanation to this. Now, Admiral Byrd, I mean, a guy as respected as he is, I mean, I'm talking about really he is one of, I kid you not, folks, one of the best explorers of the 20th century. Why would he come out and say something like that right off the bat? Why would, why would he, why would he uh, even uh, attempt, well, why would he take the chance, let's say, of damaging his own credibility because he was credible? So in my opinion, and, and I've done a lot of homework on this at, th at this point, folks, and I think that Operation High Jump happened. I think it happened pretty much the way they say it happened. I think that we we interrupted whatever the aliens were doing there, and I think that they sent us packing. Tim? Uh, yeah, that's possible. But in the original newsreel from Richard Byrd, he mentions absolutely nothing about the disc encounter with uh, the uh, warships and the uh, cruisers that were sent up there to Antarctica. Uh, th there's nothing mentioned. And that, that could be why it was kept quiet, you know. Um, all Richard Bird ever states is that he went up there with a group of people to lay claim to territory for the United States and to set up bases and to search for underground bases as well. And that was the whole mission. It, it had nothing to do with uh, flying down a hole and meeting a super advanced alien race. Although that is going around the internet as well. So what you subscribe to believe in is up to you, but there is a hole, believe it or not, in Antarctica. And I do have a picture of that. It's from uh, Google Earth. Check this out. This is from Google Earth. Now, it says uh, in the information that I found that seven 747s wingtip to wingtip can still fly straight into that hole without touching the sides of the outer rim. 
So that is a very large hole. Now, I do know for a fact that I checked this out on Google Earth recently, and this image does not appear in the Antarctic. It has been either masked or blurred out. And I also know that there is a no-fly zone over the location of where this hole is. Yeah. You cannot fly over it. So why is that the case? Are they trying to hide something? I don't mm -hmm. know. Why? Don't know. Well, the only time you restrict something is when you don't want people to see what's there. That That's the, the, the very definition of restricting something. So, I mean, if, if this was all just BS and this was just all legends and lore and all of that, to Tim's point, then why restrict the area? Why restrict that airspace? I mean, what are you hiding? You know, because when you when you start restricting something, you look like you're hiding something, right? Right. They could exactly. be hiding that the uh, glaciers are melting and that, you know, like our future is completely dependent on the fresh water reserve. And that's, you know, where 80 percent of our fresh water reserve is. And, you know, if 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 they're doing things there that are melting and the things that are in the air and um, it says that they're they are melting rapidly and but they're but they they're not they're not they're not hiding the glacier melting because they show that on public television all the time right they what do the, what, but maybe what, on the earth google they just didn't i don't know no what they're hiding is the exact location the geographical location of that hole it used to be visible on google earth tracy and now it's not it's masked oh, it's blur okay. blurred out like they're trying to hide it for some reason uh, and there is an official no fly zone over that hole yeah yeah i've you always cannot, heard that you cannot fly over it and um if you do you are approached by military aircraft that warn you away and if you continue on your way they can shoot you down yeah so there's something that they're hiding somebody okay. somebody back in the 80s got arrested um one of those, I'm trying to think of the guy's name, one of those daredevil type guys or whatever. And he was going to balloon people. or uh, somebody else. Um, he was going to do something with the balloon there or whatever. And they shut him down. Like, and he was, I mean, he was all up for doing it. And all of a sudden he was like, mm -mm, I'm not right. doing this. Right. Like, it, I, I can't remember. His, was it David Copperfield, maybe? No, it wasn't David Copperfield. It was that famous explorer that used to go around in the balloons and stuff. Foss Steve, Steve Fawcett. Steve Fossey, yeah. That's Might have been Fawcett, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, he, uh, I did a little he, research on the Antarctica, and it said, you know, that there's no reptiles or amphibians, no land mam mammals, and they did that lake, you know, there's lakes under that are 5,800 square miles, 4,000 feet reservoir, and it is minus 89 Celsius, this particular one. But as they're studying it to find out what, you know, living things are there, they said that there's 3,500 living organisms and um, that there's, their DNA is only 86% identical to the other living things on Earth. Right, right. And they actually yeah. found, a, they actually found, the Soviets actually found a, a certain kind of ravenous octopi that lived in one of those deep lakes in uh, Antarctica. And I, mm -hmm. I can't remember what they entitled it. It was some type of number, but specimen such and such. But it does exist. And it only exists in that lake because that lake has been untouched by the environment. And what is the most stable environment in our world? It's water. Mm -hmm. Least right. amount of change happens in the ocean, especially in the deep depths. So mm -hmm. there could be a lot of things down there that we don't know about, including uh, underwater civilizations and uh, alien life. Maybe we'll talk about that Russian expedition that went down that big, that deep lake that they have in the in Russia and. Uh, yeah. And the, those aliens down there, and then they forced them up, and but most of them died from the bends, I think, because they were forced up so quickly. Uh, maybe think, we'll do that story. I think that was Lake Vostok, wasn't it? I think I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, we have to do that story. Remember that days. movie, The Descent? Did you ever see that that movie, mm -hmm. The Descent? Mm -hmm. And they were um, cave 
like you know when they go in the cave for the concave diving. Well, that was a whatever. scary movie. Descent was a scary. Well, it movie. was. That was scary, and those white things were, you know, oh my god, that was those scary. white humanoids. Yeah, that was scary. Yeah. Uh, I, no, I think I think uh, Sean is Sini, or I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, but I think he's got it right. Uh, it's Lake Bacal. Bacal, Bacal or something. I think that's that's yeah, the lake that's it. About. Lake Bacal. Yeah. Th- thank that's you. Very, very good. Thank you. Oh, no, no, it's Lake Vostok, just like I said. Lake Vostok. You sure? Scratch says it. Um, Shawnee says Lake Bacal. It could be, but there. I know there's a couple of them. So Shawnee, uh, if you want to look it up and uh, bring us the information, uh, our email is in the uh, summary below each video. So go ahead and drop it to us, and we'll uh, we'll look into it, and we'll bring it up, and we'll give you credit for it. So thanks, Shawnee. Um, Tommy, let's go into that article about what's going to happen tomorrow, a big event. That's right. Let me go ahead and pull this up. Folks, uh, we've got a, a potential problem. Uh, probably not a problem, but, you know, it, it's hard to say. You know what? I don't have that, Tim, I don't think. Yeah, you do. It's in your Hangouts. Okay. Anyway, we are going to have a celestial visitor come by. I believe it's tomorrow. And let me go ahead and read you the story here. Okay. An asteroid about as long as the Great Pyramid of Giza is tall will make a close approach with Earth on Sunday, July 25th, according to NASA calculations. There is no... There is no... Sorry, they got the date wrong. It's supposed to pass tomorrow. Okay. Uh, there is no worry uh, that the space rock possesses poses any threat to Earth, but NASA monitors such rocks to both learn more about the early solar system. Asteroids are rocky fragments from that time, and because if their orbits were to change, the asteroid could pose a, a future risk to Earth. And let's see here, and it just goes into um, ten delay, ten days of restoring Earth, or top 10 related ways to, to destroy Earth. So, in other words, folks, what we've got is we've got an asteroid that's going to be passing by us. It's a big one, but apparently it's going to miss us on this pass. But what gets me about asteroids is, okay, I, th- great, it, it misses this pass. That's awesome. What about the next one? You know, going around the sun, what if something were to hit it and, and, and affect its uh, orbit or something like that, and then boom. And prob- the problem is, no matter what anybody says out there, we really do not have any kind of an effective means to defend this planet from such a strike. Okay. Even right. if we, even if we were to see it in time, people think, well, you know, we'll just like the movie Armageddon and deep impact and all of that. We'll just fly out there with some nukes and, and that'll be the end of it. Well, it's not quite as simple as all of that. Um, you know, if you're talking about something, imagine, imagine if something, a rock, let's say one sixteenth of the size of the moon were approaching this planet. All right. There's nothing we could do. There, we don't. There's no way to nuke something that big. I mean, there's there's really no even way to affect its um its gravitational pull or you know, its uh its orbit, anything like that. So we're just screwed, folks. Yeah, it could and shoot it, right through the Earth. Yeah, like it's happened before. Hole. It's it's yeah. actually happened uh, mm-hmm. several millennia ago. I guess there were two moons, and one was destroyed. By a larger body and made the asteroid belt so it has happened um the other thing i was going to say is this asteroid that's passing by us is passing by us a million uh miles away from the earth so it's close but not real close but considering its size which is 780 feet across Plus, it's traveling at 18,000 miles per hour. If it, this rock were to hit the Earth, all life on Earth would cease to exist. It would yeah. destroy the planet, but everybody on, on the surface would die. So we're very lucky it's not coming our way. Well, I mean, we've had the, the asteroid strike that, uh, that killed the dinosaurs. And uh, what, what is that? Uh, oh, God. Uh, not Yucatan, but um, anyway, we got that one. Uh, that's happened before the Tungusta thing. Everybody knows in, in Russia the the Siberian Tungusta explosion. I mean, what the hell was that? That was either a giant UFO that blew up or that was a giant rock that blew up. It's one of the two, though. I mean, no doubt about it. Yeah, no um, one knows for sure on that one. Yeah, right. So, I mean, we know that we we get these strikes periodically. There was that one that came over Russia about 10 years ago and blew all the, the 
uh, windows out of buildings and stuff like that. So it's one of those things that it's not just a matter of if. It's when. It's when it's going to happen. Yeah. And the problem is it doesn't take a very large rock mm -hmm. to cause mass destruction on Earth. It's the mm -hmm. speed yeah. of the object and then the impact. Kinetic energy. Even, even if it were to hit the ocean, you're talking about tsunamis on every continent. Mm -hmm. Huge waves. That would be bad. Sure. So may maybe that's how the Great Flood was caused, because that's what everybody's talking about originally in the chat room a little while ago, the Great Flood. Maybe that was caused by uh, an asteroid hitting the ocean. Could be. All I know is, is that um, we have that event passing the Earth, and we wanted everybody to know that's the current news that's out there. In regards to UFO news, since the UFO report, we really haven't had anything new breaking. Uh, I've scoured the news online in the papers, and they're just rehashing the same old thing about the nine-page <clears throat> UFO report. Other than that, nothing really is coming out. Yeah. Um, it's almost like it's being suppressed. And that's what we here at the UFO Man channel had thought, right, Tommy? I think, I mean, it, it's very likely at this point. Um, we know that there's a hell of a lot more information in that report that we didn't get to see. We know that it's so um, it's so profound that it's actually scared some, some of the senators that have seen it. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm just, every time I think about it, I just get so pissed because that's what we wanted to see. You know, we want to see those, those close-up shots. Show us what you're talking about. We know you have it. We know you have this material. Go ahead and show it to us. I mean, give us a break, which, by the way, folks, we do have a petition out there. It's on our website. You can go out, out to ufomannetwork.com. Go ahead and sign that petition for us because what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to let the government know that we want to see more. We want more of what we know that they have, okay? Tim and, I right. have our, Tim and I have our sources, and our sources are telling us that there is some stuff in there that would blow your absolute mind. And I want my mind blown. I'm sure you folks do, too. Yes, and so far we have a few people already signed up, but we need lots more. Mm -hmm. So if our loyal followers here on uh, the UFO Man channel would please go over to ufomannetwork.com and sign up. There's no cost. You just sign up. Mm -hmm. uh, give us your uh, John Hancock or Jenny Hancock, whatever you want to put down, and, and – uh, Put your name on the list so that we can mm -hmm. get some leverage with the Department yeah. of Defense and the Office of Naval Intelligence. Right. You know, maybe the more signatures we get, the better off we'll have a chance with true transparency. Right. We just got screwed big yeah. time. Big time. Why? What are they doing? Just blacking it out with marker again or something? They just they, they just didn't even they just didn't even provide it. That's the problem. I mean, this wasn't even a situation where like normal, like you just said, normally they would redact documentation. They didn't even bother to do that. They gave us a, a, a book report that I could have done when I was in the fifth grade. Um, and it wasn't mm. even a good book report. And they didn't give us any of the physical stuff, any of the photos or any of that. It was just so it's such a disappointment. Although Matthew Roberts, the gentleman from the Theodore Roosevelt that we interviewed uh, last week, stated that they actually did give us one thing. They only disproved one sighting, and that was that deflating balloon. Outside of that, everything else fit in their other bucket because they had four categories, like foreign yep. adversarial technology, uh, drones, whatever. The fourth one was the unknown bucket, and every single one of them, 143 sightings, fell into that category. So right. That's what uh, Matthew Roberts, uh, USN retired, said to us last week. He said there are 143 items that are considered unknown to all arsenals, meaning worldwide. Mm -hmm. No right, one has I saw the that. technology. No one yep. has the technology. I saw so, a report that I think would be interested to uh, interesting to find out what it actually is. Uh, it was the Exeter incident. I mentioned it to Tommy last night in Exeter, New Hampshire, in 1965. Uh, yeah. And what makes it so believable, I mean, is the fact that first it wasn't a lot of witnesses, but the majority of them were um, police officers. And right. 
they never, ever, ever said, you know, they could never, it still hasn't been explained to this day. And it was a 90 foot craft. Hmm. And the kid was, uh, there was one lady and she had called the police. She was pulled over on the highway and, well, she hadn't called them because it was 65. She was pulled over um, on the highway and a cop had come and asked her what was going on. And it was on a uh, Route 150 in New Hampshire. Oh, she was on a different, not far though, because it was making its way. And she said that for 12 minutes, a, she described it as 80 foot, but 80, 90, you know, in the same range had actually floated above her car, like following her. And finally she pulled over and was just so shooken by it. And then it took off. And there was a kid who was hitchhiking. It was 2 a.m. on Route 150 in Exeter, New Hampshire, around like a place called Kensington or something. I'm not sure. Somewhere like that. Um, and uh, he said, all of a sudden, there was, you know, a field and there was two houses and it being late, of course, there wasn't a lot of cars. And he starts seeing this really bright red light just beating off, you know, like it was bright and it was pulsating. And there was a 90 foot craft that rose up out of the woods, which is odd to me that it was that low and that um, it was beating off to two houses. And so, one, the people weren't home. And he had ran to that house first and was banging on the door. And then he went to the other one, but the people wouldn't open the door um, because they didn't know who was banging at their door at 2 a.m. in the morning. No car, you know, uh, his light is going off. They didn't know what was going on, so they didn't open the door. And this kid was an 18-year-old kid. He was due to start in the service in a couple of weeks. So he runs out into the middle of Route 150 and there's a car going by and he's thinking there's no way I'm letting this car go by. So he literally, you know, got in the middle of the road, waving his arms, waving his arms. And so this couple picked him up and he had them bring him right to the police station. And he was known as, you know, a good kid. You know, they knew of him and, and the officer who, um, who took, you know, his report didn't act amazed and he said uh we've had calls all night and this other officer was there and he said i just left a woman on the highway saying the same thing and so they went to where he said he saw it uh not thinking that it would still be there or they'd see anything and they got there and this is documented by at least three to four police officers plus this kid uh that it rose up all of a sudden, it rose up again, once again, out of the forest, uh, in, above the trees. And the cop reached for his, like, took his gun out. And the kid said he was more scared of the guy having his gun out because he was thinking, what is he going to do? You know, shoot it? And even the officer said, you know, what am I going to do? Shoot it? So they ran for the car and... Um, I guess, you know, the kid, he never made any money on it or anything, but the guy whose house it was there, um, he did. But he said that uh, they came to his house, someone with an attache case uh, um, handcuffed to his wrist hmm. and was being very, um, you know, you didn't see, any, you know, like very aggressive with him. And... So I thought it was a very interesting story myself. It's interesting. Yeah. We'll have to, really we'll have to uh, <clears throat> dig into that deeper on maybe another show. Uh, yeah, Tommy, any last thoughts, Tommy? Just want to thank everybody for coming out. Really appreciate it, folks. Hope we did a great show for you tonight. Um, <clears throat> had some great, uh, some great content there. Some really good videos. Again, my mind is blown by that that Tic Tac video. I just, I just yeah, love that, that video. I think it's authentic. Also, want to thank our very special guest, Tracy, the Survivor Girl herself. She's an awesome human being, folks. Check out her channel. Oh. She's always. Oh, can I drop my link? Before we yeah, go, you can drop drop your link yeah. in the chat. Go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. But I want to thank right, you for coming again, Tracy. Listen. She also lives. Oh my god, I had a great time. What what was that, Tim? 
you also live stream and uh, everybody needs to go over there and watch your live streams and sub to her. Yep. Oh, thank you. Yes, definitely. Please. Yeah. Cause I'm trying to get back into, you know, doing the cryptids and things like that and some researching. Cause I realized last night how much I missed, you know, all of that researching and going down the rabbit hole can be fun sometimes. Well, welcome. And we're glad that you were here the, tonight. Um, oh, Hold on. I still I didn't do it. I'm sorry. I'm trying. I don't have two devices. I'm doing it from my phone. I'm so okay. Sorry. We want to thank everybody in the chat room for coming. And we want to thank everybody uh, who participated online. Thank you very much. Um, from Tommy, myself, and Survivor Girl, after she gets her link in the chat room. Is it there? there go. Okay. It should be now. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I had a great time though. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. I like seeing those videos, the TikTok talk one or TikTok, not TikTok. You guys dancing a TikTok dance. Yeah. We gotcha. <laughs> never, so, never sober. <clears throat> so all of us on the panel, from all of us on the panel to all of you at home. Good night. Thank you for coming. Night, everyone. Peace, love, and tacos.